and welcome to the first Wednesday afternoon lecture of 2022. Uh, I hope you all managed to have some semblance of a break um, over, over the new year. Um, I'm Armin Rasnahan, Chief of the Section of Developmental Neurogenomics at the National Institute of Mental Health. I'm truly excited to introduce today's speaker, Professor Danny Bassett, discussing what can perhaps be best described as the science of science and the biases that this can reveal in the ways we work. So our speaker today, Professor Bassett, is the J. Uh, Peter Skirkenick Professor at the University of Pennsylvania with appointments at the departments of bioengineering, electrical and systems engineering, physics and astronomy, neurology and psychiatry. And that just gives you a hint of the diversity of the phenomenal research program of uh, Professor Bassett. They also have an academic appointment at the Santa Fe Institute. Danny is best known for blending neural and systems engineering uh, to identify fundamental mechanisms of cognition and disease in human brain networks. At UPenn, uh, Danny leads the Complex Systems Lab. Their goal is to isolate problems at the intersection of basic science, engineering, and clinical medicine that can be tackled using uh, systems level approaches. Danny received an undergraduate degree in physics from Penn State University and a PhD in physics from the University of Cambridge as a Churchill scholar and then as one of our own NIH health sciences scholars. Uh, and following a postdoctoral position at UC Santa Barbara, they were a junior research fellow at the SAGE Center for the Study of Mind at the University of California, uh, Santa Barbara. Um, Danny has received multiple prestigious awards and honors. These include a MacArthur Fellow Genius Grant in 2014, being named the Alfred P. Sloan uh, Research Fellow also in 2014, the Lagrange Prize, if I've pronounced that correctly, in Complex System Science in 2017, and the Erdosh Rainey Prize in Network Science in 2018. And most recently, Danny was named um, an American uh, Physical Society Fellow in 2021 and has been identified as one of the Web of Science's most highly cited researchers for several years running. Danny's work has been supported by a diversity of funding organizations, including the NSF, NIH, the Army Research Office, the Office of Naval um, Research, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the John and D. Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and Paul Allen, as I mentioned. Um, their academic book, coming out this year from MIT Press, co-authored with philosopher and twin Perry Zern, is titled Curious Minds, The Power of Connection. And finally, I want to share a personal reflection, if I may, as someone who's lucky enough to work closely uh, to, and to follow closely Danny's work as a colleague and a collaborator. It's hard to uh, overstate the extent to which working with Danny is a really flooring experience. One's flawed by their profound creativity, intellectual flexibility, combined with a close attention to detail and really inspirational uh, collegiality. They've had an immeasurable impact on the way I do science and the way I think about being a scientist, and I know I'm not alone in this. So thank you very much, Danny, for all of this, uh, and thank you for being here with us today at NIH. I know we're all really excited to hear your talk on thinking critically about how we do science, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Armin, um, for the extremely kind um, remarks, and all of you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. So um, yes, I titled this talk, Thinking Critically About How We Do Science. And I suppose I'll just start by saying that I absolutely love science. I love science for a whole bunch of reasons. I love the ends of science, I love the process of science, and I love the people of science. I love the intoxicating feeling of discovery. One of my recent ones this past month was the discovery of springtails, or mesofauna, from which I learned my jealousy toward yellow beings, how delicious slime mold looks when embraced, that starbursts can occur in the unlikeliest of places, look at this uh, incredible starburst of white hairs on this purple springtail, and that temerity comes in all sizes, so here the temeritas species. But in addition to discovery, I love the potential to do something good for the world, the potential for therapy and the potential for cure. In addition to the ends of science, I love the precision of the scientific method, posing a question, breaking the question down into objects and processes, developing a way to measure those objects and processes, devising a hypothesis and a null hypothesis, devising an experiment to refute one of the hypotheses, and then carrying out that experiment so as to get a clean result. 
I love inductive inference, forming conclusions from data by reasoning from particular facts to general principles. And I love the people of science with all of our fantastic personality quirks and endearingly annoying particularities. I'll mostly mention my own. I love that we are critical, that we use objective analyses and evaluation in order to form a judgment. I love that we're skeptical, that we're not easily convinced without reams of data, and that we doubt until the evidence is overwhelming. I love that we seek to be objective, that we try to leave our personal feelings and opinions outside of the laboratory and come to every um, open scientific question fairly and without bias. Science to me is a beautiful rational process of highly structured inquiry that allows us to learn more about our world. By it, we see past old theories and build new ones. We realize a phenomenon occurs because of this and not that. Perennially the skeptic, we spar with our own internal models of how things might happen, always questioning, ever critical, rarely certain. What if we were to turn this audacious questioning towards not science, but how we do science, not broadly a natural phenomenon, but more specifically a human phenomenon? This query is precisely what drives the field of the science of science. How does science happen? How do we choose scientific questions to pursue? How do we map fields of inquiry? How do we determine where the frontiers are and then step beyond them? The field of science combines information from the process of science, statistics and machine learning, and big data to answer these types of questions. I love this illustration from Nicole Same in Science Magazine, depicting the notion that science is an expanding and evolving network of ideas, scholars, and papers. Science of Science searches for universal and domain-specific laws underlying the structure and dynamics of science. To give you a better intuition for the kinds of work that are done in this field, let me mention three recent papers. First, this paper from Hofstra et al, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences, entitled The Diversity Innovation Paradox in Science. In this paper, the investigators studied 1.2 million US doctoral recipients from 1977 to 2015, following their careers into publishing and faculty positions. They used text analysis and machine learning to show that underrepresented groups produce higher rates of scientific novelty. However, their novel contributions are devalued and discounted. Or consider this paper from Wei et al, also published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences entitled Productivity, Prominence, and the Effects of the Academic Environment. The investigators studied the career and productivity trajectories of 2,453 early career faculty at all 205 PhD granting computer science departments in the United States and Canada, who together accounted for over 200,000 publications and 7.4 million citations. The investigators found that the scientific productivity of early career faculty is driven by where they work rather than where they trained for their doctorate, indicating a limited role for doctoral prestige in predicting scientific contributions and more um, role for the um, prestige of the institution in which they currently worked. Or as a third example, take this paper from Cassidy uh, Sujimoto and colleagues published in Nature entitled Global Gender Disparities in Science. The investigators studied over 5 million research papers and review articles with over 27 million authorships. They find that papers with women in key authorship positions are cited less than papers with men in key authorship positions. And this observation was true whether the paper under consideration was a single authored paper, a paper from national collaborations, or a paper from international collaborations. So you can see the average relative citations for the women in red and for the men in blue. And across each of these, you can see a gender gap here a gender gap here in the national collaborations and a gender gap here in the international collaborations. So already with just these three examples, we have seen that gender, race and class or prestige structure science, calling into question my perhaps youthful hopes for objectivity. Of these three examples, I'll now focus on Casti's study of the citation gender gap and ask why it matters, how prevalent it is, 
and how it arises. So why does the citation gap matter? Well, as Dr. Sarah Ahmed um, remarks, citations can be thought of as academic bricks. They are academic bricks in two senses. First, they are the building blocks of academic careers. They are often a measure used as a measure of success um, to determine compensation and promotion to um, and a piece of evaluation in grant and other funding awards. They are also uh, used as building blocks of collaborative opportunities and determine to some degree speaking inv invitations. So in these senses, citations are building blocks of academic careers. But they're more than that, they're also building blocks of whole fields of inquiry. So they map scholarly fields for us. They also define the space of inquiry in which we are all working. Um, citations also determine the scope of questions considered and whose questions are considered and how. Um, and they record a history of scientific ideas. As academic bricks then, citations can build a more diverse scientific community or they can erect walls of exclusion. So let's dig into one particular example, and this will be uh, neuroscience. So across 61,416 articles in five top neuroscience journals, the proportion of articles with a woman's name as first or last significantly increased between 1995 and 2018 at a rate of about 0.6 percentage points per year. And when I say um, women and men over the next few slides, what I mean is that the probability of the person's gender is being assigned based on the Social Security Administration database and gender API, which together provide the probabilities that a given first name belongs to a man or woman according to the sex that physicians assigned them at birth or to the gender or sex that they were later in life. Due to the probabilistic nature of these databases, authors in both the man and woman bins could be of any gender, including trans women, trans men, cis women, cis men, non-binary, gender diverse, gender fluid, gender queer, two-spirit, travesty, et cetera. Nevertheless, the woman bin will contain a predominance of women and the man bin will contain a predominance of men. So in these data, we can test the hypothesis of the undercitation of women consistent with what Kasti Sujimoto showed. So to do that, for each of the 31,000 citing papers between 2009 and 2018, we took the subset of its citations that had been published in one of the top five neuroscience journals since 1995, and then uh, predicted the gender of the cited first and last authors. We also removed self-citations because we were really wanting to focus on how each of us engages with the work of others rather than how we engage with the work of ourselves. We then calculated the number of cited papers that fell into each of four categories. So first author and last author being of the genders man and woman. So man-man papers, woman-man papers, man-woman papers, and woman-woman papers. Um, and we, I'll just sort of forecast that we're going to be doing the same thing for race and ethnicity in a moment so that we can see um, the similarities between uh, this gender gap and a racial and ethnic gap. So in order to determine whether a gender gap exists in any given field, and again, we're just taking neuroscience as an example, um, we need to estimate the number of citations that would be expected for that paper. Um, and how do we define those expectations? Well, one really simple thing that one can do is to assume that our reference lists are random draws from the literature. And because um, uh, the um, fields uh, of, um, of neuroscience or of uh, uh, medicine or of physics or of astronomy, as we'll see in a few moments, because they often have right now more um, men in them than if you take a random draw uh, from that, you'll end up with a reference list that has more papers written by men than papers written by women. So that's the random draw expectation. Now the question is, are papers from those groups being cited according to those proportions from a random draw? Or are some papers being cited more than or less than expected given the random draw? So that's precisely what we're plotting here along the y-axis, so percent over and under citation. And what you can see in neuroscience, consistent with what Cassidy showed, is that papers with a man first and last author are oversighted 
um, by 11.6%, and papers with a woman as first and last author are undersighted by 30.2% for a difference of over 40%. Now, you might say, and many of um, the people in our fields do, well, when I put together my reference list, I definitely don't take a random draw. There are certain factors that come into play when I choose um, what paper to cite. And those factors might include um, the year of publication. So papers that are older tend to have more citations than papers that are newer. Um, I also might care about the journal that the paper was published in. Even among the top five journals in the field, there's still a difference in the perceived impact factor of one journal versus another. So that might have a role to play. Um, I may also um, cite papers that have uh, fewer or more authors differently. I will definitely cite a review paper differently. Review papers receive many more citations than empirical papers on average. Um, and the seniority of the paper's first and last authors might be important in how I choose to cite. So we can account for each of those factors inside the statistical model, which is a generalized additive model or GAM. Um, and by uh, fitting that GAM to the data, we can then observe whether there are some groups that are over or undersighted given all of these additional factors. And what you can see is that the same result holds, which is that papers for, with a man first author and a man last author are still oversighted, and papers with a woman first and last author are undersighted now by 13.9%. So although the extent of the difference um, is somewhat smaller, um, the trends are still the same. So these are um, discrepancies that are um, not predicted by anything other than gender. So then we can ask, do men and women cite similarly or dissimilarly? And I'm going to ask the same question in a few slides about people who are white or people of color. So, um, we find that imbalance within reference lists uh, shown previously is largely driven by the citation practices of man-man teams and is significantly mitigated um, in the citation practices of teams that have a woman, either as the first author, the last author, or both. So just to show you that on the left-hand side here are the citing practices of the man-man teams in neuroscience and along the y-axis is percent over under citation. And then here are the four groups. So you can see again, the over citation of the man man papers and the under citation of the women women papers. You can see that that effect is largely mitigated in the groups that have a woman in one of the two primary author positions. So this suggests that men and women are not citing similarly. And as we'll see in a few slides, white people and people of color are also, also not citing similarly, which suggests that there may be something broader going on. But a quick footnote um, before I move into race and ethnicity is that I soon learned that a good heart, which I think I have, um, doesn't save you. So here are my reference lists pre-2019 um, when the lead author of this study, Jordan Dworkin, um, uh, shared with me his findings um, and we started to put together the paper. So I asked him to look at all of my citations pre-2019. And what you can see is a really egregious under citation of women, women groups larger than is expected um, in the, for the average scholar. So this is not something to be proud of, but importantly, it is something that I can change and have changed um, post-2019. So from gender then, I want to move on to race and ethnicity. And to do this work, we expanded our collaborative team to include individuals who have both scholarly and experiential expertise um, in the context of race and ethnicity. You might see a few um, familiar faces. I wanted to particularly highlight uh, Dr. Uh, Damian Fair, who was a 2020 MacArthur Fellow, Professor Bianca Jones Marlin, who's at Columbia University um, and was named the 2020 Allen Institute Next Gen Leader, and Kaf um, Zraza, who was a 2021 HHMI Fellow. So with this broader team, we studied or assigned um, an author race and ethnicity to an expanded data set again in neuroscience. So we used publicly available probabilistic databases and a deep neural network that learns the relationship between the names and the racial or ethnic categories in three different data sets. So the Florida voter registration data set, 
a um, US census data set and Wikipedia entries. And I'll note that both the Florida data set and the US census are obviously US centric and so will be reflective of the relationships between names and races and ethnicities in the US. Um, whereas the Wikipedia data is obviously international and so will be more reflective of those associations in the broader population. The approach that we use allows us to estimate the probability distribution across four racial or ethnic categories, Asian, Black, Hispanic, and White, based on each author's first and last names. So now across uh, 63,000 articles, the proportion of articles with a person of color as first or last author significantly increased between 1995 and 2019 at a rate of roughly 0.49% per year. So here's the percentage of publications in this orange color is the author of color, author of color papers. So that's in the first and last position. And the papers in blue here are papers that have a white first and last author. So you can see a growing um, diversity of authorship in this field. Now we're going to test the same simple hypotheses that we test in, in, tested in the previous data set. So we'll ask, um, are white papers from white authors oversighted or undersighted? And what about papers from authors of color? So here along the y-axis, you're seeing the percent over and under citation according to the random draws model. So that's where we just take a random draw from the, the uh, references papers available in the field. And because there will be more papers from white people, there'll naturally be more um, white papers in the reference list. And the question is, um, do we cite according to that probability or do we oversight the white white papers or undersight the uh, papers from people of color? So what we find is that indeed, we as a field in neuroscience, oversight papers from um, white authors. So we oversight them by 8% here, and we undersight papers from authors of color by 17.2%. And we can split that data up into who's doing the citing. So we find that white citers are like me, so people like me are significantly oversighting other white, other papers from white scholars. Um, and that's by 12% point percentage points. And uh, people like me undersight authors of color by 24.1%. So this is a difference of over 34 percentage points. Now, if you look at the practices of citers of color, they are still a little bit oversighting um, papers uh, from white scholars and undersighting papers from authors of color, but it's to a much lower degree than we see in the um, white citers. So that suggests that um, this um, a large effect is being significantly driven by one group more than the others. Now we can ask not just about that random draws model, but taking into account these other factors that may impact the way that we cite. So the year of publication of the article or the journal it was published in, the seniority of the first and last authors, whether it was a review article or a, an empirical paper. And in addition, we also include the location of the author's institution inside our statistical model so that we could account for geographical variations um, in uh, uh, race and ethnicity. And so what you can see here is that the overall trends still hold. So um, papers from, from um, authors who are white are oversighted. Papers from authors of color are significantly undersighted. And the majority of that effect is being driven by white people like me um, rather than citers of color. Now, you can put the two pieces of data together, and I think this is really important, which is to understand um, how intersectionality plays out uh, in the way that science is being um, understood and valued and engaged with. And so here, what you're seeing is along the y-axis, the first author of the paper, um, uh, the race and ethnicity, white, Asian, Hispanic, and Black, and then the gender. And then along the x-axis is the last author of the paper. So just by squinting, you can clearly, clearly see that there's a block diagonal structure, meaning um, that there's a lot of red in the top left and a lot of dark blue in the bottom right. That is the gender effect. 
So in the top left, we have papers that have a man in the first and last author position. And in the bottom right, we have papers that have a woman in the first and last author position. So this big block that you see um, is a gendered effect. But then even beyond the gendered effect, we can see an effect of race and ethnicity inside of each of these blocks. So here I'll just point out the um, the largest and lowest of numbers. So here the papers from a white first author and last author are oversighted by 24% and papers from a black woman as first and last author are undersighted by 47%. So that's an over 70 point difference. And these effects are, as I said, being driven by majority uh, groups. So majority race and majority gender, and unfortunately are also increasing with time. So um, we can ask how similar versus different are these trends across fields? So I was showing you neuroscience as an example. Cassidy took many fields at once. Can we look at individual fields and see whether there are similarities versus differences? So here, for example, is a wonderful paper just published recently in Nature Astronomy. And along the y-axis, you see the measured or predicted number of, versus predicted number of citations. Um, and then along the x-axis is the year. And um, the investigators state in their paper that we measure an average intrinsic bias of about 10%, implying that women systematically receive 10% fewer citations than would be expected if they were men, given the non-gender specific properties of their papers. Notice that astronomy seems to be doing better over time, um, whereas neuroscience appears to be doing worse over time. Um, here's an example from cognitive neuroscience as, an, as another field. And here you can see their gender uh, citation balance index. So zero would be um, hitting the expectation mark. Um, and you can see an over citation of the man-man um, papers and under citation of papers that have a woman in the first and last author category. They state in their paper, the results indicate that papers authored by men as the first and last authors have been oversighted compared with what would be expected based on the number of papers published by the journal that were authored by man-man teams. By contrast, papers authored by teams with at least one woman in the first and last author position have been undersighted. Now consider medicine. So we've got neuroscience, astronomy, cognitive neuroscience, here's medicine. Um, uh, and Chatterjee and colleagues um, uh, study the total number of citations for original research articles um, of primary and senior author gender pairs. This is a cross-sectional study across five, over 5,000 different articles. Um, and what the investigators found is that papers written by women um, as primary or senior authors had fewer citations than those written by men as primary or senior authors. Articles written by women as both primary and senior authors had approximately half the number of citations as those authored by men um, as both primary and seniors. You can see those numbers here. When the author pair is a woman primary and senior, the number of citations um, that was accrued was 33, whereas um, when the man is primary and senior, the number of citations accrued was 59. These were in um, high impact uh, journals in medicine. Here's an example in physics. Um, so here is the percent over and under citation of the man-man teams versus all of the other teams. And then here is broken down by subdiscipline in physics. So AMO is atomic molecular optical, um, CM is condensed matter, nuclear, um, high energy physics, soft matter physics and biophysics, um, nanoscience, and astronomy and astrophysics. And um, the cit citation gender gap reaches about 14% in general physics and is most egregious in reference lists of papers published in high impact journals. Uh, this study also finds that the citation imbalance in favor of man authored papers is highest for papers authored by men. Here's an example in um, communication science. Um, here along the y-axis is the over-citation of man-man papers. These investigators used data from 14 communication journals from 1995 to 2018. Um, and we find, they find that reference lists include more papers with men as first and last author and fewer papers with women as first and last author than would be expected if gender were unrelated to referencing. This imbalance is driven largely by citation practices of men. In other fields, and this is the last example, but I wanted to give you a flavor for how many different fields are finding the same thing. Um, so here in international relations, um, a paper from 2013 uh, by uh, Maliniak 
states that women are, or finds that women are systematically cited less than men after controlling for a large number of variables, including year of publication, venue of publication, substantive focus, theoretical perspective, methodology, tenure status, and institutional affiliation. They also find that articles authored by women are systematically less central than articles authored by men, all else equal. This is likely because, and they give several um, uh, factors, including that men who make up a disproportionate share of IR scholars tend to cite more men than women. In political science and social science, Dion et al. in 2018 showed that analyzing all articles published from 2007 to 2016, they find that female scholars are significantly more likely than mixed gender or male author teams to cite research by female peers. And finally, Mitchell et al., again in international relations, finds that empirical analogies, analyses suggest that male authors of articles in uh, two large journals in the field are less likely to cite work by female scholars in comparison um, with female authors. So with all of that data in front of us, we can ask, you know, well, what do we, what do, we do about this? And how do we think about it? And how do we think about what it means um, for science? So um, here are a couple common responses um, that I've heard uh, in, in response to, to these data. The first one is kind of like, well, you know, white people just write the best papers, shrug. Um, second one is, well, men just write the best papers, shrug. The third one is, I just cite good science. I don't see race. I don't see gender. The fourth one is, I work in a field where there are no women or people of color. It's not my fault, it just is. The fifth one is, I'm sure my field is different. I mean, there are famous women or people of color in my field. And then the person goes on to list two names. The third or the final one is, I can't believe you admitted to underciting women, the horror. So those are the common responses, but I wanna think about how we can respond as scientists taking that wonderful scientific brain that I love in all of us and turning it towards these data. So let's be scientists, let's be skeptical, let's be critical, let's be objective, and let's be objective about us. <laughs> Let's look at the data. Let's look at the fact that this is coming up in many, many different fields, that it's happening both in gender and in race and ethnicity, um, and think hard about what that might mean. We can also think objectively, skeptically, critically about all of the further data outside of citations about gender and racial inequalities um, being pervasive, not just in our world, but also in academia. Um, and note the prior work that has reported gender and racial inequalities in compensation, in grant funding, in credit for collaborative work, in teaching evaluations, hiring and promotion, productivity and authorship. We sh should look at these data and, and recognize that scientists, we, me, are not some special breed of human, immune to racism, sexism, classism, et cetera both as something we have inside of us and as something we inherit through structures of oppression in the institutions around us and around science. So let's be scientists and figure out what are the drivers of these inequalities? Well, there are a couple factors that are very clear. Um, the first one is that uh, several of these studies show that the citation inequalities are driven to some degree by a citation practice that has re remained the same since 1995, in, while the um, demographics of our communities have changed. Our fields of science are growing increasingly diverse at a wonderful rate. It's not fast enough, but it's better than zero. Um, but our citation practices are not keeping up um, with who is in our field today. They look more like who was in our field in 1995. Second, um, gender imbalance in co-authorship, uh, in the co-authorship network of a paper's authors partially explains the gender imbalance in author citation behavior. So in other words, if I tend to collaborate with people only of, a, or mostly, mostly of a certain gender or mostly of a certain race, then I will also end up citing according to those probabilities to some degree. So this is a challenge to us, I think, to think differently about how we cite outside of our co-authorship network, but also maybe to change our co-authorship network to be um, broader, to be more diverse, to be more inclusive. Third, racial and ethnic segregation in co-authorship networks is increasing 
despite greater field-wide collaboration. Um, and fourth, um, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but one of the factors that seems to be very clear is that there's homophily. So we end up citing people that are a lot like us. We cite people of our own gender and we cite people of our own ethnicity and race. Um, this is called homophily. Homophily in um, citation networks is very prevalent across these fields that I've just um, canvassed for you. Lastly, I wanna think about electronic publication. Um, there's a very interesting paper from James Evans that was published in Science Magazine in 2008 that was called The uh, Electronic Publication and the Narrowing of Scholarship. And in that paper, he uh, uses a database of 34 million articles and their citations from 1945 to 2005. Um, he also used the online availability from 1998 to 2005, and he shows that as more journal issues came online, the articles referenced tended to be more recent, fewer journals and articles were cited, and more of those citations were to fewer journals and articles. So searching online is more efficient and following hyperlinks can quickly put researchers in touch with prevailing opinion, but this may accelerate consensus and narrow the range of findings and ideas built upon. I think that's a call to de-narrowing. And lastly, let's be scientists in attempting not just to identify the drivers, but mitigating some of these drivers of inequalities. So one thing that we can do is to very quickly check and fix our own reference lists. And that's something that we do regularly now. We use this um, online uh, freely available toolbox uh, where you can put in your reference list and obtain a um, prediction of whether you are close to expected proportions are, or farther from them. And then you can think if you are far from the expected proportions, who is it that I'm missing? And very often for me, the people who I'm missing are the people who have gotten faculty positions in the last five to 10 years. These are the people that it's my responsibility to know more about and whose work is my responsibility to um, engage with in an intellectual way in um, the, the work that I do. Secondly, another option is to append a citation diversity statement to my paper, uh, which I'll mention on the next slide. And the third is to bring more inequality to light to develop more mitigation tools. I'll just highlight a tool that's freely available on the Chrome Web Store. It's called Citation Transparency, and you can use it. It was developed by Jenny uh, Stizo, and you can use it to um, identify the uh, predictions about author demographics as you're searching PubMed or Google Scholar. So what is the citation diversity statement idea? Well, this is something that we're appending to our papers and, and many other investigators are doing so as well. It has several sections of motivation, methods, results, and limitations. And I'll read it very briefly to you. So it says, recent work has identified a bias in citation practices such that papers from women and other marginalized scholars in STEM are undersighted relative to the number of such papers in the field. Here we sought to proactively consider choosing references that reflect the diversity of the field in thought, form of contribution, gender, and other factors. We use databases that store the probability of a name being carried by people of different genders to hold ourselves accountable, to not perpetuate bias at the intersection of name and identity. We place the author in the bin W if they have a name with a probability of 0.7 or more belonging to a woman. And we place an author in the bin M if they have a name with a probability of 0.7 or more of belonging to a man. Based on the databases used, that W bin will contain a predominance of women and the M bin will contain a predominance of men, but both bins may also contain other genders. By this measure and excluding self-citations, our references are like this. Um, and then in terms of the limitations, we say, you know, this method is limited in that names, pronouns, and social media profiles used to construct the databases may not in every case be indicative of gender identity. And furthermore, probabilistic studies of names cannot be used to detect costs that are specific to intersex, non-binary, and transgender people who are out to a large number of their colleagues. We look forward to future work that could help us to better understand how to support equitable equitable practices in science. So why do this? Um, we do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, to hold ourselves accountable. Number two, to increase global awareness of citation imbalance. And number three, to point readers to relevant tools for mitigating disparities. The community's response has been overwhelmingly 
positive, despite those remarks um, that I read to you earlier. So um, editorials from Brain, from Nature Neuroscience, from Nature Reviews Physics, from many other journals have been published. Um, Trends in Cognitive Science published its first diversity statement in 2020. Um, some journals are including a citation balance indicator on their submission policies page for authors and giving them the tools to, to, to evaluate their references critically. Um, Many uh, high impact uh, journals across many different fields now have published citation diversity statements and Cell Press, which publishes 50 plus journals um, in the biomedical sciences, initiated its inclusion and diversity statement in 2021. BMES, which is the Biomedical Engineering Society, which publishes four journals, also encourages authors to include a citation diversity statement within their manuscripts. And um, for the papers that have included a citation diversity statement over the last year and a half, um, those papers are citing much closer to the zero line. So here what you can see is the uh, pre-2020 you know, or 2019 um, citation practices. Uh, and then in the dots are papers that include a citation diversity statement. And you can see that the data points um, include zero in all four cases, which means that this um, disparity has been brought to down to the expectation mark which I think is um, a, a mark of progress. But of course, it's always more than the numbers. So I want to think more carefully, more deeply about where and how we are citing. Are we slapping references on at the end or engaging with them intellectually from the start? Are we citing equitably in all the other ways like invitations, mentions, emails, retweets, et cetera? So in closing, I just wanted to think again think critically about how we do science. A citation gap is part of how we do science. Um, as building blocks of academic careers, the citation gap is about who does science and who even gets to do science. It's as building blocks of fields of inquiry, the citation gap is also about our collective trajectories through the space of discovery. And when I think deeply about how we do science, I think about the beautiful physics of branched flow. So for those of you who, who don't know about branched flow, this is the branched flow of, of light, which is just amazing. Um, but in many kinds of irregular media, and I would call science an irregular media, um, propagating waves enter this beautiful and relatively neglected regime called branched flow. It affects sound, light, water, and matter waves over vastly different length scales from the very tiny to um, tsunamis. So if our waves of inquiry are guided into narrow branches defined by a famous thinker, a privileged gender, an advantaged race, a single ethnicity, a certain class, or a given prestige, what tremendous swaths of discovery space are we leaving unconsidered, unexamined, and unknown? I think we have an opportunity to use the beautiful rational process of science to learn more about how we structure our inquiry. We have an opportunity to be perennially the skeptic, sparring with our own internal models of how we do science, always questioning, ever critical, rarely certain. Pervasive gender, racial, and ethnic inequalities mean that science isn't as objective as we think it is. How can we see past old theories of science and build a new one? How can we down, lay down a new practice for a science of tomorrow? So with that, thank you so much for listening and I'm very happy to go to the question and answer period. Thank you so much, Danny, for an absolutely fabulous talk. I can hear the applause uh, throughout the virtual uh, network of people listening. It, it was what a, what a stunning, sobering and motivating way to, to start the new year. Thank you very much. Uh, we have lots of questions rolling in, so I'm going to read off some of those, um, but I might take the privilege of perhaps sneaking in one myself. Um, looking forward to the future, and I, I like how you spoke about, well, we can diagnose the difficulty and then start to think about how to change things. Is there a ray of hope in that? Is Did you find if you stratified the citation practices by the seniority of the authors, that people who are just coming in, there might be a different future coming? Not to say that we shouldn't be more proactive, but that is there change on the horizon? That is such a great question. We did not stratify by the age or 
um, seniority, we accounted for it in the model um, because that does have an impact on how much someone is cited. Um, so, so I don't have data for that question. However, it's a great question and I could answer it um, if we go back to the computer later today. Uh, so it's really, I, I do, I would have that hope. I think that's probably the case. Um, however, I'm also sobered uh, by, by my own citation practices because I think a lot of it was, was just, um, well, I wouldn't, I'm not young, but I'm also not very old. Um, and so I would have assumed that I should have done better, um, but I'm, but I didn't, and I think that's because I didn't know. I didn't. It hadn't even occurred to me um, that such that these effects could be holding and across different dimensions, like race and ethnicity and gender. It's probably also class and prestige. Um, to you know, and where somebody's uh, institution is, where they're, where they're you know publishing their paper. So, I think um, I think there probably is good on the horizon. However, it. I think it would, it does require some awareness. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And maybe on that topic, just before we dive into the questions that came in, uh, would you be comfortable maybe sharing a few kind of personal experiences you've had as you've been negotiating that journey of changing your own citation practices? Are there some tips that you have for, for people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I mentioned um, during the talk, what I've realized is that um, I'm, I'm not, educated and I'm not, I need a practice of self-education on the work of younger colleagues. Um, and I think that's what has been missing um, for me. And that's what I've found to be the most helpful now is, you know, to go listen to the talks of the postdocs who are about to go on the market, um, look up the people who have just gotten positions um, at local, uh, at, you know, institutions and, and look at their work. I think it's, it's very much about not, um, assuming I'll just hear about the relevant work, um, but act, because I think that the hearing about has, has um, inequalities built into it too, yeah. right? Um, and so I think that there's just a little bit more emphasis on personal responsibility to, to educate myself about the work of the people who are in my field um, and, be, and to be skeptical about the notion that I already know my field, I don't. And I don't think any of us does. <laughs> so there's a lot, there's a lot more to know. There are many more people to know. There is a lot more work from those individuals to know. Um, so I guess that, I would say that that's been the most helpful um, observation for me. Thanks for sharing that. And that's a super actionable thing. I think that everyone can kind of engage in. So that's that's great to to have that shared. Thank you. Okay. So some of the questions that came in. One was from Laura Carter. Um, how can you tell who are authors of color? That's a good question. Um, so, um, it depends. Um, so I guess that there are, there's a, there's a difference between, let me say the algorithm. Maybe that's the, the biggest place to start. So the way that the algorithm works is that it takes um, first and last names and examines the probability, the, the, yeah, the frequency of letter pairs. So if L and Z are next to one another in their first or last name, then that would give a clue about the race or ethnicity of that person, that it comes from this language and that language is associated with this race and ethnicity. Um, so it's a, it's a language based and, and um, uh, letter pair frequency based assessment. Um, so what that means is that there is uh, there are for sure, just as in gender, um, there are people who are in the white bin who may not appear white. There are people who are in the um, uh, uh, Asian bin that may not uh, appear Asian. Um, and so there's a difference, there is certainly a difference between a person's um, physical appearance or visible identity um, and the identity derived from their name. There's also another yet identity, which is what who how they identify. Um, so that we often call that self-attestation. That is, this is you know the race and ethnicity I am, this is the gender I am, um, etc. So there's there's an interesting you know milieu of what are the features that we see in others. Do I, do I see you, Armin, in, in real life? Um, or do I just see your name? Um, do you, have I ever asked you your gender identity? So there's many things that are questions about um, 
you know, what are the what are the pieces of information that we have just by looking at papers, and and those pieces of information may our our cognitive apparatus may use implicitly um, to drive citation practices, and then what are the pieces of information we know about our colleagues um, from asking them um, or seeing them, so uh, which can which can drive a different set of citation practices, right? So I think in the future, it will be really interesting to, to understand more of um, those different facets, which makes it more complicated. Thanks. And I think it was really lovely the way you, the methods you've been employing find a way of still being able to, to uh, take a quantitative approach, even in the face of the complexity of the variables that you're wanting to look at. Uh, there are still ways we can kind of push against that um, and provide the data we need to motivate change. Um, so another question by Anne Corsi. In my experience, one of the biggest influences of whether I will cite a paper is whether the paper can be found in open access publication or whether uh, or otherwise easily obtainable format. Often I run into a paywall. Have you looked at whether the various groups you examine are publishing um, and where the various groups you examine the publishing and how that fits with your citation data? Yeah, that is such a great question. We have not explicitly looked at that. However, um, we are aware that open access um, in many journals requires a hefty price tag, um, which means that there's an association between the wealth of the lab um, and the number of open access papers. And because there's also an association between the wealth of the lab and gender, race, and ethnicity, um, there will be a predominance of, uh, there will be a skew uh, in the demographics of authors um, of open access publications on average. So um, that's, that's, my, that's my knowledge of it, but I don't have, have the data to show you, except um, that would be my hunch. Thank you. Um, another question from um, Tiziana Cobliati, and this might relate to the network perspectives that you were mentioning. How much personal professional interactions affect citing practice? Could it be that authors tend to cite more often other authors they know interact with professionally? Could this affect, reflect some kind of segregation or selective clubs? Um, yes, definitely. So the way that we see this, the, um, that's that's quantifiable, uh, is that we tend to cite very locally on our co-authorship network. Um, so I may I may cite people that I co-author with, but I'm also likely to cite um, people that they co-author with. So like two steps away from me, um, it's much less likely for me to cite somebody who's seven or eight or nine steps away from me on the co-authorship network. And so what that ends up meaning is that a lot of our citations are relatively local um, to collaboration, which is a social um, structure in addition to being a scientific structure. Um, so I think that that's where the, the social part comes in. Yeah, thank you. Um, Tiago Ferreira asks, thanks for what says great, thanks for the great talk. And um, any possibility to propose an impact factor like index regarding diversity in journal, uh, journal publication? acceptance or citation? A diversity impact? I don't think I'm quite following that question. I wonder whether the question relates to sort of scoring journals or the, the, the oh. diversity. Of that's interesting. Um, I don't, I, that's really interesting, just as a, as a sort of mark of, hmm. yeah, I don't know. I've, that's, that's a great, this is a really interesting suggestion. Um, it's not one I've heard of before. I do know that, that journals differ significantly in the degree to which their papers are being, are, are you know, have reference lists that are, um, you know, um, tracking the field uh, versus not tracking the field. And um, it, at least in, in physics, I'll give physics as an example. In physics, the papers that public or the journals that have more papers um, from women in them do tend to do better on average in their, their, their general citation practices. So um, that's one thing to think about for journals that are um, invitation-based. So some of the nature reviews journals, for example, are invitation-based. Um, the reviews of modern physics is invitation-based. I, I know that there are several others. And so that's something I think maybe to be aware of is that um, you, those invitations could be considered 
um, for whether they're being distributed, uh, you know, in a in a in a way that is um, equitable. Yeah, yeah. You make me wonder whether the gender composition of the editorial board um, could potentially kind of track some of these metrics. Um, yeah. But it's hard. There are lots of mechanisms that could account for that, I guess. Um, related to that, I was wondering if you had any hypotheses about the reasons that different fields are showing different time trends. Why is neuroscience doing so badly when astrophysics is doing so well? Well, relatively speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am so curious about that as well. <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, I, you know, a very, a, uh, you know, really positive thought about neuroscience is that maybe, maybe the um, field is growing more diverse more quickly. And so if that's happening and the citation practices are lagging behind, then it's going to make it, the gap it will be widening. Um, and we just need the citations to catch up with the demographics of the field. So it could, I think there's an interesting you know, constellation of factors, which will include how quickly a field is, is uh, changing its demographics by who's being hired and who's um, continuing on in, in, in research. Thank you. And perhaps as a, a final question, maybe from uh, Dennis uh, Kovanda, we spoke a lot about the value of quantitative approaches, which your work just, just demonstrated so beautifully. But I wonder if you could speak a little bit, or Dennis wondered, to the value of research using qualitative data or perhaps a complementary mix of the two with these sorts of questions in mind. Yeah, I, I definitely think that, that qualitative work is very important. And I and I attempted to allude to that, um, if if offhandedly, um, in terms of you know, are we are we citing people in all the other ways, uh, in you know, invitations um, to speak in the symposium that we're organizing, or um, tweeting about this person's work, or et cetera. So there's a lot of there's a lot of other you know, more qualitative ways. And even, even the way that I put the citation in, is it, you know, in a long list of lots of other citations, see references one through 10, or is it, you know, so-and-so did this amazingly beautiful study um, that showed this really important thing. So there's, that's qualitative, I think, and that's, that's harder to quantify. I think that's really important because it isn't really about the numbers. It's more about a culture of science uh, that we want to live in. Um, but I guess, I would also say that as, you know, I admit to being a scientist, so I like the data. I like to see um, that, you know, something is quantifiable. Uh, and so I, I see merit in that. I also see merit in the, in the quantitative approaches because they can show us some factors that are driving what's happening, like the co-authorship networks, for example, or the fact that citation trends just, just aren't changing when the field is changing its demographics, right? Um, these, these factors help us to sort of wrap our head around why. And I think once we understand, understanding a li little bit more about why guides how we, what things we might change or focus on. So I, I like the quantitative factors um, for that reason too. You. Well, thanks so much. I'm getting lots of um, thank yous coming through the, the chat. So I'll channel the, 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 the audience's thanks. Um, a really fabulous talk that just highlighted the, the special sort of Danny flavor, I think, that, that, that you bring to the work. So thank you so much. It was just uh, um, thrilling and profound and actionable uh, and a lovely way to start the year. So thank, thank you. you for your time. Thanks, everyone, for coming and listening. And um, and look forward to seeing you at the next uh, at the next Wednesday afternoon lecture talk. Thanks, everyone. Bye.